but for those of you who don't know DSA, uh, we are the American affiliate of the Socialist International, and the Detroit chapter has been active in a number of areas. Uh, we've helped to pass six local living wage ordinances in, in Southeast Michigan. We've worked on single payer national health insurance for the last 20 years. Uh, we're active in uh, fair trade, or organizing around fair trade. And now, the most recent effort is on behalf of uh, public investment in jobs, which we feel is the critical issue today. And in fact, on your chairs, you'll see a flyer for a vigil. Uh, it's called First Friday's Vigil that DSA has endorsed. Uh, we'll meet, be meeting at the uh, Labor Legacy Memorial in Hart Plaza on March 4th. Sam, I believe that's 4.30 in the afternoon, is it not? And uh, to protest for the need for public investment for jobs. And that really is what we're talking about today. Um, our first speaker is Bill Barkley from the Chicago Political Economy Group. Bill has a very interesting history. Uh, not only is he a PhD sociologist who was actually educated at Michigan State, uh, but he also has a background in economics and worked on the, was it the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? Chicago Board Options Exchange. Chicago Board Op Options Exchange. Uh, so he has intimate knowledge of finance and uh, the whole structure of derivatives and collateralized debt obligations and, and all of that that led to the, the Great Recession. So he speaks with a, a, a real experience and authority on this issue. Um, and with that, I will turn the floor over to Bill Barkley. Bill? So, the title is The Political Economy and Deficit. And, and I chose that title on purpose because the Jeff, we do face a serious deficit. It's a jobs deficit. And the deficit we face is a jobs deficit. That deficit was, or the impact of this kind of deficit was perhaps best captured many, many years ago by a woman named Jane Adams, who founded the Hull House Settlement House in Chicago when she wrote in 20 years at Hull House, of all the aspects of social misery, nothing is heartbreak is unemployment. We, I'm using the deficit term deliberately because I think we need to take that term back from the people who are now using it in terms of deficit hysteria around the economy. They're, they're wrong about what the most important deficit is. So what I'm going to do this morning is do three things. I'm going to briefly describe the nature of the jobs deficit, both short term and long term. I'm going to then describe a program, a proposal for a program that we at the Chicago Political Economy Group de develop to address the question of jobs deficit, and then I'm going to talk about how we pay for it. So, we'll go on to the next slide. A little bit of background, just to remind you that this isn't the only time we ever faced this kind of jobs deficit. Back in the 1930s, there was a similar kind of jobs deficit. In 1932, when the Democratic Party met in the city from which I now come, Chicago, they met in a city that was 40, had 45% unemployment rate. They were a party that had won the presidential election only three times since 1860. They nominated the man who was known as a trimmer, that is somebody who hedged his positions, who wouldn't take clean positions. That man, of course, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They took quite a few ballots for them to nominate this person. His main opponent was Al Smith. Al, Al, Smith's, opponents, Al, Al Smith's supporters chanted, beer, 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 because they also had the question of prohibition, the repeal of prohibition. So it was an interesting convention. Anyway, Roosevelt came out of the convention as a nominee. He didn't talk about jobs in the campaign. In fact, he actually attacked Herbert Hoover for running up the federal deficits, the fiscal deficit. But he won 57% of the vote. And shortly, almost immediately after he came into office, he called his staff together and said, I want to put together, I want to put 500,000 young men, and it was young men in his phraseology, I want to put 500,000 young men to work by the summer. Now remember, he didn't come into office in January. This is March, because the freshman presidents used to come in. I want to put 500,000 young men to work by the summer. His staff looked at them, stunned. I'm part of a group that supports one of these First Friday operations in Chicago, and so actually I was one of the speakers at the last one in February. It's quite cold in Chicago on February the first Friday. So we made our points fairly quickly, and these were the points we made. That when we looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics report on the job situation, the unemployment rate was 9%. There are almost 14 million people unemployed, but that's only sort of the part of the story. There were another 8.4 million people who were working part-time who said they wanted to work full-time but couldn't, or didn't have a chance to work full-time. Another 6.4 million who were discouraged workers 
and had not looked for work any time in the last four, four weeks. Some had looked for work in the last 12 months. 36,000 new jobs were created in January 2011. We have a new movement into the labor force every month of about 110 to 120,000. So once again, we fell behind. Here's putting those things together, how, how, how bad the jobs deficit is. You've got the official unemployment, the 13.9 million. You've got the underemployed, the somewhat over 8 million, 8.4. You've got the discouraged workers. You put them together and you took it talking to the neighborhood of 30 million people, 28 to 30 million people, who are either un or underemployed. And that may understate it, but at least because we also see a growing portion of the population not in the labor force. So they don't get counted in any of these categories. Let's look a little bit more about this immediate problem. 43% of the unemployed people in the official unemployment numbers were long-term unemployed. That means they've been unemployed for more than 26 weeks. In fact, I was with a, a, a meeting with Jobs and Justice the other day. There's a woman who was a member of the IBEW. She's been out of work for almost two years. She's a construction electrician. And she said, once you're out of work for a year, very, very hard to get rehired. Well, she's doing a lot of training. I try to keep her skills up. When we look in 2010, the economy created on average 94,000 new jobs a month. That sounds good until you remember we have to create between 110 and 120,000 new jobs each month just to break even. So we lost ground. We lost ground in 2010. And we are now 1.1 million fewer jobs than at the end of the Great Recession. Now, you may have missed it, but the Great Recession ended in June of 2009. The National Bureau of Economic Research declares the beginning and ends of the recessions, and their ending date was June 2009. So we are now 19 months beyond the end of the Great Recession. Like I said, you may have missed it. It's a sinker. But that's what it is. What? Um, so we've lost ground over the end of the Great Recession, and when you look at what we where we stand before the Great Recession started, we're down over 6 million jobs in terms of people being employed since, uh, beginning, since December of 2007. So we, are, we have a huge jobs deficit, and the jobs deficit that is not adequately being addressed by any of the programs out there now. I want to take a slight digression here because I've noticed in the last couple of months there's been the reemergence of an explanation that comes every so often when people talk about unemployment, structural unemployment. That, uh, Bill Clinton last year said, there are jobs out there, it's just that workers don't have the skills. Um, recently, a governor of the Fed in Minneapolis, Minneapolis Fed, said the real problem is one of skill mismatch. And then last week, the Washington Post had a front page article where they looked at the unemployed in Fresno, California, which has a very high unemployment rate, looked at the jobs opening and said, the problem is people just don't have the right skills. This has some interesting implications if you buy this explanation. After all, if the problem is that workers simply don't have the right skills, then they have got to do something themselves, get those skills. There's no point in spending time creating demand management, right? Workers should go back to college, do more training, whatever. But stop and think about this for a minute. Is it likely that people who were employable two or three years ago all of a sudden don't have the right skills? What technological revolution occurred between 2007 and 2011 to change the demand for skills. But this is also an empirical question. Let's see if it actually stands up to the evidence. If the problem is this kind, of, if this is the problem, if the problem is skill mismatch or structural unemployment or lack of worker training, we should see certain things. We should see some sectors, that is the sectors that are demanding highly trained workers, with a real strong demand for labor, a labor shortage, not a labor surplus, a labor shortage. We should see some sectors with rapidly rising wages. Because after all, those are the sectors that we be bidding for these highly skilled workers that are supposed to be in short supply. Thirdly, we should see the premium for college educated workers growing versus that for high school educated workers. So these are all empirical questions. I'm an economist. I look at this kind of stuff. What do we see? None of those. With the exception of mining, and I don't think that mining jobs are what people have in mind when they talk about people going back to college and get educated. With the exception of mining jobs, we don't find any of those kinds of patterns. There's no evidence that some sectors are facing a labor shortage. Um, the unemployment, the, re the relative levels of unemployment by educational level have not changed. It's true you're more likely to be unemployed if you have less than a high school education versus a high school education versus college. But those relative levels haven't changed. It's just all gone up. 
There is, thirdly, there is no difference in the proportion of long-term unemployed by educational level. And finally, we don't see that premium of pay, wage, and salaries for college-educated people growing over high school educated people. Yes, there's a gap. You're better off if you go to college, and on average, but that premium isn't growing. What is happening is there's greater wage inequality within each educational level, but not between these educational levels. So everything we see is consistent with the notion that we have a demand shortfall. Back to FDR and John Maynard Keynes. We have demand shortfall, not a question of structural employment. The next chart just gives you two snapshots of who are the people who are unemployed. I think we know this. Construction particularly is hit very hard. It's pretty much across all sectors. Now, that's the picture in the Great Recession. But you know, when the Chicago Political Economy Group, when we sat down to develop a jobs program, we didn't do it in the last year. We sat down in 2008, early 2008. We sat down to develop a jobs program to address what we saw as long-term trends in terms of job creation or the lack of job creation in the U.S. political economy. There's some groups that are hit harder by these trends. Obviously, minorities are, are less likely to find employment, less likely to find good employment. But if we, if we, we concluded from the time we spent studying and thinking and reading and doing analysis on the U.S. political economy that we had a long-term problem in terms of unemployment. And so we build our program around six principles. This, by the way, is, you can go find us on the web. There we are, cpegonline.org. We have to post our comments on the BLS, um, BLS employment report. Uh, there's the one from January. We haven't got the one from February up, but I took the screenshot. I hope it's up there now. Here's our six principles, and I'll try to demonstrate each of them. First, the private economy has failed to develop sufficient jobs or jobs to meet the needs of our working population for a long time. This is not something new. It's true that because of the Great Recession, people are much more aware of it now, perhaps. People are much more focused on it. But this has been an ongoing problem. Secondly, the access to jobs, particularly to good jobs, is unequally distributed by race, ethnicity, and gender. So the jobs that are created, the good jobs that are created, there's unequal access to them. Thirdly, the lack of jobs is not because there's a lack of work to do. I'm going to come back and talk about each of these in a minute. But the lack of jobs is not because there's a lack of work to do. So we have, fourthly, what we consider a double failure. At the macro level, the economy has not generated enough jobs. And at the micro level, it doesn't distribute the good jobs equally across different sectors of the working population. Fifthly, because of this long-term problem of the private economy, we need to turn the government to the state in order to generate jobs. Sixthly, and this is a value judgment, that we believe that just as the program that, we're, that I'm going to outline should be redistributive in terms of who benefits, so paying for the program should be redistributive in terms of who pays. That's, that's how we're going to pay for this. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. OK, let's look at each of these in turn. Again, I said a lot of people are now aware that we're having trouble taking care of, they're having trouble finding jobs, people became unemployed in the Great Recession. But that isn't new. If you divide the U.S. history since World War II into two periods, 1945 to 1975, 1975 to 2010, and you look at it on a monthly basis, you find an interesting pattern. In the 30 years, 1945 to 1975, there were 75 months out of the 320 months in which the unemployment rate is below 4% below 4%. Many of us may, can't, maybe can't even remember the last time the monthly unemployment rate was below 4%. That's because in the last 35 years, 420 months, there have been five months in which the unemployment rate was below 4%. Clearly a very different experience for working people and for all of us in this country in the last 35 years, over the 30 years immediately after World War II. Secondly, up until 1980, up until the recession of 1980, when we had recessions, the recovery was fairly quick. In fact, on average, it only took nine months from the end of the recession, dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research, June 2009 in this case, only took on average nine months from the end of the recession for the number of jobs to return to the level before, well, that existed before the recession. A very quick bounce back. The longest time it was was 12 months. 
Since then, however, in 1990, after the 1990 downturn, it took 23 months for the number of jobs to return simply to the number of jobs that existed before the downturn. And after the 2000, 2001, it took 39 months. People started talking about jobless recovery. 39 months is a long time just to get back to the number of jobs you had before. We are now 19 months beyond the end of the Great Recession. And we are obviously nowhere near the number of jobs we had before. As I said, we're still down about 6 million jobs. So we are, I think, in all likelihood, going to break that 39-month record. So what we saw here is this long-term failure of the U.S. political economy to generate jobs and to, gener and to resp respond to economic problems, economic downturns. It's also measured in a couple of other ways. Our, US, our labor force participation rate has been declining. It's a little bit different experience than you find in other Western industrialized countries. We're now down to about 62.4, 62.5% labor force participation rate, down from about 66 or 67% 10 or 12 years earlier. I mentioned the long-term unemployed before, but it's interesting again the contrast. In 1980, the 1980s recession, the unemployment rate did pass 10%, but only one in four at that time were long-term unemployed. As I said, we're about 43, 44, 45% long-term unemployed. So the U.S. political economy is failing to generate jobs, is failing to recover from the time when it goes into economic recession. Here's the labor force participation rate. In economists, I have to have a graph every so often. There you are. You can see that it's been going down. Let's take to the second point, unequal access to good jobs. We all know this, I think. The jobs that are generated, particularly the good jobs that are generated, are not equally uh, available to people of different races, ethnicities, and genders. A couple of quick measures. The simplest one is probably to look at the wage level, the average or the median wage level of different sectors of the population. As in 2009 and 2008 data, what it says in 2009 that white males, the median wage level of white males was about one and a quarter times the median wage level of white females. <coughs> Median wage level for white males was a little bit over one and a third times the median wage level for black males. Median wage being the wage halfway between the top and the bottom wage. 2008 data, I wasn't able to update this, but we looked at white males versus Hispanic males, it's about one and a half times. Even within different racial and ethnic groups, there is this disparity across genders as well. well it's thus marked, but black male, black female median wage gap was about 10%. Hispanic male, Hispanic female median wage gap, also about 10%. This is also evident when you look at who holds what kinds of jobs. What I've done here is to say, let's compare the proportion of jobs that each of these groups has in these various economic sectors with their share of the total labor force. So what it means is if you're at 1.0, it means that if you have your, your appropriate portion, if everything were allocated equally, your, your proportion of, the, of those jobs. So for example, if you were if you're Hispanic, Latino, um, which is about 15.3% of the labor force. If you had 15.3% of the jobs in, say, wholesale trade, and you can see that's very close, then your job allocation and your labor force share is roughly equal. What we see here again is the point I just made in the previous overhead that jobs are allocated differentially across different sectors of the population. So, not surprisingly, we find that in construction, heavily male, and interestingly enough, Latino over overrepresented construction. When you look at things like um, health care, obviously heavily female, because the male percentage is less than less than ratio is less than 0.4. Or you look at education, Latino down about 0.1. So we find this pattern that I'm talking about, about the economy that generates insufficient jobs and allocates access to these jobs differentially across different sectors of the population. This is important when you're thinking about a jobs program in terms of how you address these kinds of issues. Yes, part of the ceiling says there's work to be done. Um, there are several examples of work to be done. Robert Pollan, who works, who is at the Political Economy Research Institute at UMass Amherst, calculated there are about 24 billion square feet of public buildings, hospitals, and schools that needs to be weatherized. It's about 20% of the total 
square footage of buildings in the whole United States. So 24 billion square feet, that's a lot of work to be done, a lot of jobs that could be created if we had a program to do it. Second example, if you go to parks, particularly national parks, but even some state parks, and you look at these sort of dusty plaques on the trails or other facilities, you find an awful lot of the work that was done was done by the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and not a whole lot, in many cases, have been done since then. So there's lots of work to be done there as well. Thirdly, we are, about, we are almost alone among rich countries who decide that the care for the very young and the very old is primarily a private responsibility, primarily the responsibility of fam their families and their kids. Most countries you look at, there's a large part of the labor force that is involved in either ch uh, child, child education, child care, before, before after formal schooling, and in elder care. We don't do that. So there's jobs to be created there as well. You can all go on with other examples, I'm sure, but this is just some evidence that lack of job is not because there's a lack of work to be done. So what that says, or said to us is at the political economy group, is that we need to think about what an economy is all about and figure out how to get there. And we believe that the primary goal of any economy and of economic policy should be to generate jobs that provide a livelihood for everybody willing and able to work. That is to say, the primary goal of economic policy should not be to make, keep interest rates low on the sovereign bonds. The primary goal of economic policy should not be just to grow the GDP and not worry about how it's distributed. The primary goal of an economy and economic policy and the criteria by which you should measure it is how is it meeting the need of people for jobs who are willing and able to work. And jobs that are able to provide a livelihood for themselves and their dependents. Since that hasn't been the result of what the private economy has done, our argument then says we need to turn to government, to the state. And since the failure is long term, we need to talk about jobs program from the government. It's also long term, not short term make work jobs. One thing that would mean is the size of the public sector would increase. And I realize that people are talking about decreasing the size of the public sector, but that is, I think, going the wrong way. We, are, we have a relatively small public sector by international standards. And interestingly enough, We'll see on the next slide, smaller public sectors tend to go with greater inequality. These are taking basically the rich countries, the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development Countries. And what you see on one side is the public sector as a percentage of the gross domestic product, and you can see the countries. And you see this number that economists like call the Gini Index by these countries. The Gini Index is simply a measure of how unequal or equally distributed the income is. If the Gini Index were zero, everybody would have exactly the same amount of income. If we're one, one person would have it all. So you see that the U.S., with the Gini index of about 0.45, is definitely an outlier in terms of that measure, as well as having by far the smallest public sector. And we're well below the, the average for these countries. Go to the next slide. Some people say, well, it's true, you know, we have, we have more inequality of a small public sector, but we grow faster. Uh-uh, it's not true. This is per capita gross domestic product growth, 1979 to 2008. We're sort of middle of the pack, actually low middle of the pack. Interesting. Interestingly enough, some of those with very, very more, much more equal societies like Norway, Netherlands, Sweden, are growing consistently more rapidly than the U.S. So that we have a political economy that doesn't generate jobs, the jobs that does generate it are not allocated equally across all sectors of the population, it generates a fair degree of inequality, particularly compared to other societies that are of the same level of economic development or economic growth, and doesn't grow particularly fast. We don't get into chaos. So that's it. Okay, but what does our program look like? Well, Ronald Emanuel, who wants to be mayor of Chicago, said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. And we thought that was actually good advice. Um, so we thought the best way, and still think, the best way to respond to the situation that we find ourselves in, both short term, the Great Recession, but again, I want to emphasize long term, the long term failure of this economy to generate jobs, is to create a jobs program on the scale, the scope, and 
and parameters sufficient to handle it. Um, and it should be a program that is financed from those that have benefited from this last 35 years of lack of jobs growth and increasing inequality. In doing this, we sat down and said, okay, we've got to think about the number of un, un and underemployed. We have to think about the rate of growth of the labor force. We also took into account the projections of jobs that would be created by private sector. We're like, not saying that we're going to create all the new jobs through the government. The private sector is supposed to create some jobs. And then we also thought about what kind of impact might the jobs we create in the public sector have on that rate of job creation in the private sector. Because, they, because if we're talking about good jobs that pay a decent wage, some of those jobs that might have been created in the private sector at the low end of the wage scale might not be created because they wouldn't be competitive with the opportunities that would be opening up under this jobs program for people in these new jobs. So we have to think about the possibility that the rate of creation of new jobs in the private sector might actually decline a bit. The conclusion we came to, and this now may be a little bit shy of where we need to be, the four million jobs per year over each of the next five years. And this is how we came to it. At that time, the private sector was expected to create between one and a half and 1.6 million jobs per year. Now, you know, if I go back to go back to the numbers I gave you a few minutes ago, 94,000 jobs a month in 2010, they haven't, it hasn't done that. So that's why I say this may be a little bit low in terms of what we need to do going forward. We said, well, maybe as many as two-thirds of those jobs would actually be lost because they'd be low-wage jobs and people would take these jobs in the public sector that we're going to talk about in a minute over those jobs in the private sector. So maybe we needed to talk about a million jobs a year there. So we need to create three and a half million jobs a year from direct or indirect government action, plus the 500,000 jobs a year from the private sector to get to our four million jobs per year. This is a somewhat optimistic scenario because it assumes the private sector will continue to grow along those lines. And as I said, it hasn't. Then we said, Knowing what we know about the U.S. labor force and what's, how jobs are created, what do we need to think about in terms of how to, how to design this jobs program? We need to remember that we want to reach labor or working people in all the different sectors of the labor force. One of the things that, the, for example, that didn't happen in the New Deal was much job creation in, rural, in southern agriculture. And the New Deal programs tended to be more, designed, more directed towards males than females, although not exclusively. So we need, we, need to say, we need to keep in mind this kind of segmented labor force that I showed you on the graphs in terms of targeting the jobs we created. We need to think about what kind of economic policy we want. We need to think about where are the jobs that are being lost. <coughs> so we said jobs need to be created across three different sectors, broadly, very broadly speaking. Yes, there need to be these traditional infrastructure jobs, building bridges, building roads, but also refurbishing schools and health facilities. A lot of this would put people back to work who have been employed in the construction sector. Yes, like that woman I met from the IBEW, but more but probably to predominantly males, because we saw from that graph that males tend to be dominate construction sector jobs. Secondly, though, another sector, we have a social service, a social investment deficit. We need to create jobs for teachers and teachers' aides, nurses and CNAs, elder care and child care workers. I mentioned a while ago, we're almost unique among rich societies in saying that the responsibility for child care and elder care should be a private responsibility. Um, the countries that are doing better than we are, or equal than we are, don't, don't accept that proposition. So that's the second sector. And we need to talk about a forward-looking industrial policy. That is, focus on a policies that would develop the areas of green technology, when you talk about light rail, or power generation, a variety, whole variety of areas there that need to be part of any serious jobs program if we're going to meet the needs of our country going forward. I'm going to take a slight digression on industrial policy. In this country, most, most pundits, most, polit most uh, political officials dismiss the notion of industrial policy. They argue it doesn't work, that the market does things better, and the market responds to changes more quickly. It's a remarkably blind perspective, because I think if you ask the Japanese, did industrial policy work? If you ask the Chinese, does industrial policy work? If you ask the Scandinavians, does industrial policy work? The answer would be yes, in all cases. Different kinds of industrial policy, but yes. And I think it also misses something else. We have actually had, de facto, an industrial policy for the last 35 years. Globalization. Globalization and let manufacturing jobs go and, and focus on finance. 
That's been the industrial policy. Sometimes it's more clear than others, but it is true that there's never not been a, a bipartisan commission down in Washington, D.C. saying this is going to be our industrial policy, but that has been the de facto industrial policy. How well does it work? Well, pretty well for finance. In fact, uh, financial entities' share of all corporate profits more than doubled in those last 35 years. And we periodically, I think you all read periodically in the newspaper about the salary bonus levels of some people who work in finance, so I'd say pretty well for them. It also is part of the reason we managed to export our financial crisis to part of the rest of the world, because we, uh, our, our financial leaders like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, etc., sold the securitized debt obligations, securitized mortgage-backed assets to the rest of the world. Very early on in this financial crisis, I came across this little article, a little town in Norway that had bought all this stuff, the town was bankrupt because of this, unfortunately. And I love Norway, I've been there two times, I really like the place. Um, but given that it's worked for some people, I think, and it's brought a certain amount of excitement into our lives, I think we can agree that on balance, the cost of this kind of industrial program, a focus on finance and letting manufacturing go, is not a cost that's good for our society to bear, and we need to move away from that. We should be aware, by the way, that this is not the first time that that, in, that industrial policy has presented problems. We had the savings and loan crisis, we had Asian Tigers, and some of you may not remember this, but in 1998, something called long-term capital management got in trouble. It was this hedge fund that had a connection to so many other banks, big banks, that finally the New York Fed called everybody in the room and said, you're not leaving until we figure out how to get out of this mess. And if you look at that crisis in detail, you see exactly the same kinds of things, writ small, compared to what happened in 2008, 2009. You see leverage, you see securitization, you see mathematical models, you see this, you see this belief that nothing could really go wrong. Long-term capital management had two Nobel, Nobel Prize winners on this board who were part of developing the mathematical models. It should have been a warning shot to us, but we paid no attention to it. So this has been an ongoing series of crises. We're just in the biggest one right now. So what do we mean by good jobs? If we're going to create good jobs, not just jobs, but good jobs. Well, first thing we mean, I think, is they should be a living wage salary, living, living wage level, that you, that you can support the worker and his or her dependents. Now, when we looked at the program, we did some cost calculations. And we, we ended up saying, let's use what the time was the median salary level at the end of 2009, which probably hasn't changed a whole lot because wages and salaries are not going up and inflation has been fairly low. So the median, the median salary level, median wage level at the end of 2009 was $18.50 an hour, about $38,500 a year. We also, however, because we're concerned about drawing back into the labor force people who may not have had, may have had limited training, limited experience in the labor force, we recognize, and this was actually pointed out to us when we sat down and talked with um, the staff of my representative, Danny Davis's staff, uh, that we needed to talk about a training wage for people who have had less experience. So we said some of the people will start at a training wage, which we designated at $11.75 an hour, which is actually the dividing line between poverty and non-poverty wages. The idea that they would train, they'd learn, they'd learn the skills, they'd do the jobs, and then they would move up in this wage structure. So we went forward from here, and good job should be something that also provides some security against unexpected catastrophes, which have some say in how work is organized. That is to say that people who get jobs under this program that we're suggesting would be eligible or be, have, be able to freely associate together into any kind of association or union that would choose to do so. And they should also have access to the public pension program, Social Security. Finally, because this, the job problem is long term, this program is long term, there needs to be training, like, there needs to be career ladders within these jobs. So, all of these things are things that need to go into the program. So, we put all this together, put all this together, and then calculated the cost. Each, the first year, we had, we, had, we had made some assumptions about how many what portion of the, of, the, of the 4 million people would be in training jobs, training wage level versus the $18, $18.50 wage level. Um, so that's why slightly different year over year. The first year was going to cost $117.5 billion. By year five, it would be $127.5 billion. We put in, that includes some overhead costs. We put the overhead costs in at 5%, which is higher than the cost to run Social Security, but we thought there might be some more complicated overhead costs here. We also put in some supervisory labor. This was a bit of some of a bitter dispute within the group as to whether we should pay supervisors more, but we finally decided, okay, there'll be a 30% premium for people in supervisory roles. 
That's not as high as in the private sector because we're trying to squeeze the, we're trying to compress inequality. Um, we put it all together, and by the fifth year, remember, you're, if you hire a new cohort each year and keep them employed, on very conservative assumptions, you're paying the complete wage bill for each cohort. So it's so it's aggregated, it's, it's cumulative. By the fifth year, it would run about $860 billion, or approximately 6% of U.S. GDP in 2009. Now let me know, we, there are some offsets that we didn't include. So this is a very, this is a high estimate. We didn't include what you would gain by not paying unemployment insurance because people go back to work. We didn't calculate in the taxes that people might pay. Um, in fact, according to Robert Pollan, every 1% decline in unemployment cuts about $90 billion off of the federal budget in terms of either money in or money not spent. I think that's probably a little bit high, but we didn't do any of that. We, we wanted to be you know, up front here in terms of what the total cost might look like. So we came up with that total cost by the fifth year and going forward, $860 billion a year. As I said, about 6% of GDP in 2009. So we decided, let's, well, let's think about this. We decided we have a philosophy, the Willie Sutton philosophy. Some of you may not have heard of Willie Sutton. He was a very famous bank robber in the 1900s. And uh, robbed over 100 banks, spent a fair amount of time in jail. But was a guy, from all accounts, everybody who met him liked him. He was a charming guy. And in fact, he was, he was told, asked near the end of his life, well, was the gun loaded that you used to rob the banks? And he looked at the reporter and said, no, somebody might have gotten hurt. <laughs> now, who knows what he done with that shit? But another story about Willie is that the reporter asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. So, just go on. So we've got this $860 billion total. We thought, that's a lot of money, you know? This was in August of 2008. Sort of cast your mind back, August of 2008. $860 billion, a lot of money. In two months after that, we learned that really isn't all that much money, that you can find that amount of money if you need to, because you know, two months later, Henry Paulson came to Congress and said, we need about $775, $800 billion, and don't ask me a lot of questions about it, but I'm going to use it to bail out the banks. So maybe it isn't outside a lot of money. But we said, let's figure out how we could pay for this program. Because remember, our sixth principle was not only should the program be redistributed in terms of who gets the jobs, making sure we get access across all those different sectors of the workforce to people with good jobs, it should also be redistributed in terms of who pays for it. And this is important because even at the time we developed this, and much more so now, people are busy on TV telling you the fiscal cupboard is bare, there's no money, we can't we have to cut back, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have something else. Um, we need to lower our expectations. Now, we could, of course, choose to finance it by deficit spending, but we decided, well, we're not going to do that. So let's talk about how we're going to pay for it. Next slide. What Keynes is saying up there is if the, if the economic development of a country is, is handled by a casino, it's not likely to be handled very well or well done. He's talking about, he's talking about <coughs> trading stocks, primarily. So where is the money? The money is in the finance sector. In fact, we looked at this idea partly because Keynes himself had at one point proposed a tax on trading the stocks. James Tobin, a Nobel winning economist, proposed a tax on the trading of currencies. In 1989, two economists wrote a paper arguing for financial transaction tax. It's actually a very good paper. Those economists were Victoria and Larry Summers. Yes, it is that Larry Summers. I don't know how he feels about the paper now. I've not had a chance to ask him. Uh, but actually, it's a very good paper. Since then, of course, people like Joseph Stiglitz, Paul Krugman, and others have urged such a tax. In the 111th Congress, there were actually a couple of bills that proposed a somewhat weak, a fairly weak version of the tax. We put a letter in, you know, support of one of those bills, the one that Peter DeFazio from the state of Oregon proposed. The United Kingdom has long had a fairly modest financial transaction tax. They have a tax on the trading stocks. Um, and it's interesting because people will usually say, well, if you put this kind of stock tax on trading, trading will go elsewhere. The United Kingdom has the second largest stock market in the world. It's only the sixth largest economy. So trading hasn't gone elsewhere, and they don't even tax everything that should be taxed. Right now, in the United Kingdom, there's something called the Robin Hood movement. Some of you may have gotten emails from them. And the Robin Hood movement, which has some really cute videos about this, wants to expand the tax and up the tax to deal with the, the same problem they have over there. 
can't quite see this down at the bottom, but in the current Chicago mayoral election, one of the mayoral candidates, Miguel de Valle, has proposed a version of this tax at the city level. We gave him some data to work with. So there is some interest in this. All right, let's go to the next slide. How much could this, how much could we raise with all of this? Well, when the Summers wrote in 1989, the total value of stock trading in the United States was $2 trillion. It's a lot of money. In 2008, the total value was $70 trillion. It's hard to think about many things that have increased 35-fold over that 19-year period. We probably do have 35 times as many cell phones. Like that I'm, I'll grant you. Uh, if we had 35 times as many cars, most of us would not have made it here today. If we had 35 times as much food, the world would live in abundance. So it's a very peculiar kind of growth that happens in the financial sector. It's not that there's 35 times as much stock to trade. In fact, there was only about four times as much stock to trade. So the trading rate has accelerated very dramatically. What I've talked about in terms of just the stock market itself is also true when you look at the derivatives based on stocks, whether you call futures and options, or whether you talk about trading of currencies, or whether you talk about trading of debt instruments, such as bonds. In all cases, the trading has accelerated dramatically, partly because a lot of it can be computer-driven, and partly because even if you make only a little tiny bit only a fraction of a cent on each share you trade, for example, when you trade it enough and at low cost enough because you have computer programs, you can end up making a lot of money. The senior regulator in the United Kingdom, Lord Adair Turner, commented on this, said much of this trading is socially useless. Um, he, he obviously, that was not well received by people in the city of London, <laughs> but he stuck by his guns on this. So a tax on the trading of financial assets would tap the social useless activity. Let's look at the tax for a minute. Well, here's, here's the growth of the finance sector, and you see this fairly dramatic shift somewhere in the very late 70s, early 80s, in terms of the financial sector as a share of U.S. profits and the average pay per worker in the finance sector compared to the average pay overall. So clearly what's happened in these last 30 years, 35 years, has been this huge growth of finance, and it's been a boom to people, or many people in finance. Now, I know people in finance who don't make a lot of money, but there are people who make a whole lot of money. Go on to the next slide. Okay. So we need, in terms of designing the tax, a good tax, an effective tax, a fair tax. We need to think about different instruments. That is, there's stocks, but there's also uh, in, uh, futures on stocks, options on stocks. Uh, we need to think about different markets, on exchange, off exchange. Um, we need to design a tax, we think, it should not disadvantage or advantage any one of those markets or those kinds of instruments. Because we don't want a tax that just shifts trading from one place to another. That is, if we tax stocks and people say, okay, we'll just trade stock options instead. Or we tax uh, stock futures and people say, okay, we'll just trade stocks instead. And we want a tax that cuts across all markets and is fair in terms of the way the markets operate. So this is what we came up with. We propose a $1 fee on every $400 of stock traded. That's one quarter of one percent. And for reasons that I, are technical, I can go into if you want to on a question, I won't bother right now. A one dollar fee on every eight hundred dollars worth of currency, debt, and derivative trading. That is one eighth of one percent. <coughs> you can see more details on this in an article I did in Descent in the summer of 2010, or you can go to a much more detailed paper at CPEG Online and see how we came up with those numbers. But if we apply those numbers, to the total value of trading in stocks, bonds, currencies, and derivatives based on those products on an average basis in 2005 to 2009, we would have raised somewhere between $750 billion and $1.3 trillion every year. We just paid for our jobs program. We just paid for it. What impact might a financial transaction tax have? Would it undermine U.S. competitiveness? Now you might say, so what? They got us into trouble too bad they could be. <laughs> if, they're, if they're stuck. I did spend 22 years in finance, and so maybe I'm a little bit biased in this. Uh, I think we need to answer this question. But if it did certain things, I don't think it would be the end of the world. If it reduced the level of trading in finance, that would not be a bad thing. Because, as Lord Adair Turner said, much of this is socially useless activity. It's hard to explain what trading at the rate of getting, say, one sixteenth percent a share of profit does for all the rest of us in the world. It makes a lot of money for people who do it fast enough, but it doesn't do much else for the rest of us. In fact, if this reduced level of trading 
half and double the cost of trading, the people doing the trading wouldn't spend any more in terms of trading the rate of profit would be reduced. If we reduce the level of income that you might expect by going into a financial career, and more of our bright young people became engineers or doctors, would that be a bad thing? By the way, I teach in an MBA program, and um, the other day we had a meeting with all the other people in the program, and I said to the administrators, you know, I'm getting these emails from you being concerned about cheating. Is there a problem? And they said to me that all the surveys show that people in MBA programs are much more likely to cheat than other graduate students. Dramatically more likely. And I think that's partly because of that war, that very high income that you hope to get. So if we reduce that incentive, if people went into other areas, that wouldn't be a bad thing at all. Now it is true that some clever finance people might decide they wanted to go elsewhere than the U.S. Or the, if they could find it elsewhere. And I guess my advice would be don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. <laughs> so who would, who would pay this? Think about this a little more seriously. Who would pay this? Obviously people who trade. I've day traded, I have friends who are day traders, but I am not under no illusion that day trading contributes to the social well-being of the country. And if you're day trading for one quarter of 1%, or I should say one half of 1%, because you pay it, go, pay it buying, pay it selling. One half. If you're trading for one half of 1% profit, you can't do better than that, probably should go out and get a real job. Um, hedge funds, of course, would pay it. If you look at who actually owns and trades stocks in the United States, it's true that about half the population own stocks in some way, shape, or form, but most of that is through a pension fund or some other kind of fund. It's only in the top 10 or 15% of the population by income levels that you get significant stock portfolios and significant <coughs> stock trading activity. And people at those income levels can probably afford the money, that one half, that one quarter of 1%. Now, if you have 401k and you choose to put it into stocks, yes, you would pay it. But think of it this way. If you put your 401k money that you have into stocks into an index fund, like an S&P 500 index fund that says all we'll do is just mimic the returns of the market, the S&P 500, or mimic the Dow Jones, we won't be doing a lot of trading because those indices don't trade, change, you'll do better over the long run than paying somebody who is telling you they're going to actively trade and try to beat the market. All the studies I've seen over the long run show that. So, better off. Would this make us an outlier? in terms of our tax revenue to GDP ratio. Let's take a look. Here we are right now. Tax revenue is part of GDP. There we are down on the far bottom left side of the screen. Now let's go, let's assume the tax were in place. Okay? The average, and this by the way assumes that we, our GDP doesn't grow at all. If our GDP grew, we wouldn't even go up that much. We're still below the average for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. So yes, it's an expansion, an expansion in terms of public sector, it's an expansion in terms of the role of money to collect it to finance jobs, but it's an expansion that would be good for the country as a whole, good for our working people, and I would argue because it would make us a better society. One of the interesting things that I'm not going to talk about is if you look at these countries and compare their Gini indexes to things like health care, homicide rates, happiness, as self-reported, and, and the way people respond to the question, do you think most people in society can be trusted? The more equal society is, the better the, the longer they live, the lower the homicide rate, the lower rates of obesity, and the more they're likely to say yes to that question of do you think people can be trusted? So all of this would be for the good of our society and our people. That's, I think, probably enough for me this morning. <laughs> <laughs>